picking up that message and amplifying it and carrying it into our own work and, and spreading it, uh, which is uh, a large part of what this presentation is going to be about. Uh, now, that we're kind of pressed on time here because we're a little bit, a little bit squeezed, so I'm going to just keep moving through this and we'll try to get some time at the end to discuss it. <laughs> So the first part of the presentation uh, is where did the middle class come from? That is, uh, uh, where did the 99% come from? And, and in, in talking about this, we want to be aware that uh, there were major differences between uh, within the 99% as well as within the, uh, the 1%. Now, America was supposed to be different. Right? It was supposed to be different from that historical pattern. Uh, and in America, in, uh, in the last several decades, we're, we're discussing, guys, where the middle class came from. And uh, then we'll move on to the 1% uh, in a moment. But the, uh, in America, three great social movements created a middle class. And they were the labor movement, the civil rights movement, uh, and the women's movement. It's a fight we knew all too well in Flint, Michigan. For it was here that my uncle and his fellow workers first brought down the mighty corporate interests that dominated their lives. It was the day before New Year's Eve in 1936, and hundreds of men and women took over the GM factories in Flint and occupied them for 44 days. They were the first union that beat an industrial corporation and their actions eventually resulted in the creation of a middle class. But back in these days of the flood sit-down strike, the police and the company thugs were not going to just stand by. After a bloody battle one evening, the governor of Michigan, with the support of the president of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt, sent in the National Guard. But the guns of the soldiers weren't used on the workers. They were pointed at the police and the hired goons, warning them to leave these workers alone. For Mr. Roosevelt believed that the men inside had a right to a redress of their grievances. Okay, then who are the 1% and, and how did they get there? Well, here is a typical specimen <laughs> of the 1%. Uh, this, this is uh, John Strunk. He is the highest paid banker uh, in America. Uh, and you'll see that his net worth is only 50 million. Now, actually, he's in the top 0.1%. But it goes on much further than that, and only 50 million. When you look at our mayor here in New York, or Mayor Bloomberg, or Warren Buffett, or, or, or Gates, uh, there are several decimal points over from this guy. Uh, so that what we find here uh, is that there is a much greater difference between the bottom of the 1% and the top of the 1% than there is between the bottom of the 99% and the top of the 99%. But nonetheless, uh, he's, he's more or less typical of, of who we're talking about. Salary 19 million uh, as compared to about 44 million uh, for the average, 44,000 a year for the average family. In fact, what the middle class owns compared to what the 1% owns uh, is absolutely astonishing. The richest 400 Americans now own as much wealth as the whole bottom half of the population, 150 million people. Uh, but how could that have happened? Right? This, it wasn't supposed to happen uh, in this country. Well, for a while, we were all doing better together. Now, th this isn't the 1% on the top here. It's the top 95% or the top 5 uh, and, and, and the bottom 20. Uh, but what we see is that from the end of World War II into the middle of the 70s, when much changed in America, uh, people didn't have the same amount of money. That's not what it's showing. It's showing that their incomes were increasing at more or less the same rate. Uh, that the poor were getting better off 
at the same rate that the rich were getting better off. Now, it doesn't mean that the poor weren't still poor at the end of that period. Uh, it just meant that uh, their wealth had increased, or their income had increased at the same rate uh, that the wealthy did. Uh, and then at the end of the 70s, that began to diverge much more dramatically uh, for several reasons. The first was the economic push from World War II ran out. Now, you remember before World War II, that was 1940 to 41 in America, we had had 10 years of the Great Depression when nobody could afford to buy anything. And then we had five years of World War II when pay was good and there was full employment and people could afford to buy stuff, but there wasn't anything to buy because it was all going to war production. Right then in 1945, about 5 million GIs come back from the various war fronts. Uh, they get GI loans and go to college under the GI Bill, uh, and they start moving to the suburbs and they buy a home and furnishings and cars uh, and all, all that stuff. Uh, the two-car family gets invented. It's amazing. And, and uh, there's great economic stimulus from that that lasts for about 20 years. Uh, and in addition to all of that, uh, the industrial base of Europe and Asia had been destroyed, and the U.S. got the job of rebuilding it all. Uh, and then it took about 20 years before Volkswagens and Hondas began to show up here, uh, and the competition was back. And that marked the end of the steady growth in family income that had gone on into the 70s, and then it starts being very erratic after that. Deindustrialization begins in large parts of the country, and in the country as a whole, uh, industry moves away. We'll talk about that more in a moment. There's a shift to the Sun Belt uh, of industry and population, uh, which increases the uh, strength of the right wing. And, and union membership then declines, both as a percentage of the workforce and absolutely. The U.S. goes off the gold standard in 71, uh, allowing for all kinds of funny money, which we'll talk about soon. There was a major fiscal crisis in the cities where all major cities in the country went broke uh, in the early 70s. The trade balance, the difference between what we sell to other countries and how much we uh, buy from them, uh, goes negative in the 70s. Economic growth stagnates beginning in the 70s and continues to stagnate. And Nixon goes to China in 1972, which was great for world peace. But the result is that now none of you have anything about your persons which wasn't made in China. So that, that everything starts to change in the 1970s. Getting super rich meant war on the middle class. President, Senator from Vermont is recognized. Uh, Mr. President, there is a war going on in this country, and I'm not referring uh, to the war in Iraq or the war in Afghanistan. I'm talking about a war being waged by some of the wealthiest and most powerful people in this country against the working families of the United States of America, against the disappearing and shrinking middle class of our country. Uh, the reality is that many of the nation's billionaires are on the warpath. They want more, more, more. Their greed has no end. And apparently there is very little concern for our country or for the people of this country if it gets in the way of the accumulation of more and more wealth and more and more power. The war on the middle class began because the 1% and the large corporations had always wanted more. It used to be that working people in America worked in American factories and they had union jobs and they made decent money and the companies made decent profits. Uh, and you would hear this advertising jingle when you turned the television on, uh, but I don't think any of you remember it. workers, the factory owners always wanted the workers to work faster and faster. All right, girls. Now, this is your last chance. If one piece of candy gets past you and into the packing room unwrapped, you're fired. Listen.
Well, then the owner's got a big idea, right? Get rid of the people altogether. Now, I would rather have a candy bar that was packed by this robot uh, than those other two, uh, but it led to a uh, serious difficulty. But what we're looking at here on the top is productivity, more stuff made at lower and lower cost because people are being replaced by robots. At the bottom, we're looking at average family income. And you can see the same pattern again, that they're kind of going up together uh, from the end of World War II through the 70s, uh, and then they begin to diverge. Right? There's another thing that changes in the 70s. Uh, and if you can sell the stuff, the difference between these two things amounts to extra profit, but what's the problem here? <coughs> Who, who, yeah, that, 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 that's the problem, right? Robots can do everything people can do except one thing, right? They can't eat candy and they can't buy cars. It turns out that it's easy to build a factory. It's easy to make a product. It's hard as hell to sell the product when so many jobs have been taken by robots. And, and the difficulty in selling stuff then starts to shape the rest of the economic history from this point on. So then the 1% had another great idea. You know, make the stuff in even lower wage countries and sell it here. While US industry rusted, American companies began to bail out. I don't mean bail out like a bank bailout. I mean like bailing out of an airplane. The time said this. <clears throat> With a new surge of investment abroad, many American companies are shedding the banner of national identity and proclaiming themselves global enterprises. The result is that our goods production falls and low-wage service jobs begin to grow. And as industry withered, we began to import more from other countries than uh, we sold to them. That, that's the red line there. And what happens if you for years, uh, buy more than you sell. Trade deficits. Well, what does that actually mean practically, though? Money leaves the country. Money leaves the country and people go into debt. debt. Right. Corporations borrowed, government borrowed, investors borrowed, families borrowed. <laughs> People got distracted in the middle of all of this. Instead of focusing on the economic problem, it was look at those immigrants, look at those gays, welfare cheats, unions, look at the school teachers, the women's clinics. And while they were distracted, their pockets were being picked by who? And here's the result. New data from the Commerce Department shows employee pay now down to the smallest share of the economy since the government began collecting the information. But the 1% found their way out of the bind at the expense of the rest of us. And we call it the casino economy. Now, there are three related economies in America, not just one. There's the real economy that all of us are in, where people work and do services or make things. There's the imaginary economy, where people gamble on the future value of pieces of paper. And then there is the super fictitious imaginary economy, uh, and that includes Bernie Madoff, who <laughs> pretended to make investments and didn't. Uh, it includes uh, Enron that pretended to make profits and didn't. Uh, and it includes a whole part of the financial sector that basically prints money. And these two are very closely related. So by now, everybody was in debt. A debt became larger than the whole economy. Here, the, 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 the red bars are the, the gross domestic product. The blue bars are the total debt, you know, government debt, credit card debt, student loans, mortgages, all that debt. Now, debt is bad for us. It's bad for cities and states, but it's great for banks. Right? We've got to remember, debt is the product they sell. They call it credit, but it's debt. Right? Depends on who's got it. Once you have it, it's debt. When they have it, it's credit. Uh, and, and that's what they make their profits on. It's in the bank's interest to keep wages and taxes low to force people and governments to borrow. Just for example, in New York State, uh, our, our state government and municipal governments pay $14 billion a year to banks uh, just in debt service uh, on loans, uh, which we can't get out of because, of course, you can't raise taxes. 
And then the 1% discovered the magic of banking. They used to make profits by paying labor less than the value of what it produced. Uh, and that wasn't exactly fair, but at least there were jobs. Now they make money by magic. <laughs> now how is the trick done? Well, to start with, our view of banking may be a bit out of date. No, but you're, you're, you're thinking of this place all wrong, as if I had the money back in a safe. The, the money's not here. Well, your money's in Joe's house, that's right next to yours, and in the county house, and Mrs. Maitland's house, and a hundred others. Like you're handing them the money to build, and then they're going to pay it back to you as best they can. Now, what are you going to do, foreclose on them? I well, that was Hollywood. Right? Real banks don't just lend out their depositors money. Right? They create money with a few keystrokes, and we pay them to borrow money that they don't actually have. Now this is a, uh, from a booklet, uh, Modern Money Mechanics, a workbook on bank reserves and deposit expansion that was published by the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. I think they realized that they said too much. Uh, and so they took it away, but it's still readily available on the web. And they say then, they're telling the story of money for people who want to know the story of money. Then bankers discovered that they could make loans merely by giving their promises to pay, or banknotes to borrowers. In this way, banks began to create money. Transaction deposits are the modern counterpart of banknotes. It was a small step from printing notes to making book entries creating deposits of borrowers. For example, we now know that in the 08-09 credit crisis, the Federal Reserve made 7.7 .7 trillion in bank loans. But when you examine their financial statement, you find that they only had a little bit less than one trillion in assets. Right, and that was everything they had, including their computers and their buildings and all of that stuff. So this is what they had, right? This is what they loaned. <laughs> but where did the money come from? <clears throat> Basically, they printed it, right? And that, that, is, that is the best kept secret of the financial system. Then the banks that they gave the money to the Fed gave it to, loaned it out themselves. And they made, according to Bloomberg, $13 billion in profits loaning out the, the non-existent money that the Fed had created for them to loan out. Uh, and then we find this in the Times. Banks prepare for big bonuses. Everyone on Wall Street fixated on the number. All in cash and stock will run into billions of dollars. <laughs> With industry less profitable, the 1% put the money into Wall Street instead of Main Street. Every form of financial speculation grew at an astonishing rate. The stock market is a good example, right? Shares traded daily in millions. Currency speculation starts to escalate. This is derivatives, right? These, these are the financial instruments based on bad mortgages that people didn't know were bad mortgages, and you can see the increase in that. <clears throat> so what we're seeing is the financialization of the economy. And this is true in all mature capitalist economies where the economic growth tends to stagnate. And we find this here, it's what's happening in Europe, uh, it's across the board, and they haven't a clue as to what to do about it. Thank you. 
Trump's from Magnetar. The economy collapsing like a dying star. No one will know till it's on and be your head. It's time to hit the town. This sucker could go down. The housing market's losing steam. And all we gotta do to make our dreams come true is man against the American dream. Now it used to be that banking raised money to start up other activities. Oh, you can, you can see some of them here. And this is, this is the, the, the first laptop you're looking at. <laughs> but now, banking and debt speculation have become an industry in their own right. Finance has surpassed manufacturing as a source of profit. Uh, and this graph shows us the percentage of all profits coming from manufacturing, and you can see what's happening to it, and the percentage coming from finance, and you can see how that is increasing, which is just another way of demonstrating that capitalism on a world scale in, in the mature countries uh, is going through the process of financialization where money moves out of industry and, and other productive activities out of service uh, and into speculation. And that, and that becomes uh, where the new fortunes get made, unless you invent the iPod. Right? The, the iPod, the iPhone, uh, there, there's still room for that kind of stuff to go on, uh, but the main trend is financialization. While well, the 1% got rich, we paid the price when it all crashed. This is probably the truest thing that's been said. Banks and brokerages are a house of cards built on the confidence of creditors and clients. the 1% started looking for other ways to make money, and now they're coming after the middle class for profit. Public facilities sold to investors, like the toll booths on the Jersey Turnpike were sold to investors, the uh, parking meters in Chicago were sold to investors, teachers, fighter fires, and police laid off, tax cuts for the rich, service cuts for us, a tax on union wages, unemployment benefits held hostage, mortgage foreclosures, and Wall Street wants the Social Security Trust Fund, which is going to increase by two and a half trillion over the next several years. That's what privatization of Social Security is about. But what are the one percent doing with their money? Right? Corporations and investors aren't short of cash. That is the biggest myth. And if given more money, they aren't going to invest. They're now sitting on a combined two trillion dollars in cash in the last quarter of the last year. We don't have the, 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 the fourth quarter out yet, this is the third quarter. Right. The Federal Reserve reports cash balances rose by 88 billion uh, from, from, from March to September. Business Week says US private capital markets are loath to tie up their billions in factories and machineries. I love the word loathe. You don't hear loathe said very often. I loathe. But why is that true? Why are they loathe? Why not? You can only produce so much. But if people can't buy it, why put more money in the machine, more capital? Right, people, the problem is you have to sell the stuff. Right, if, you, if you're putting money into factories and machineries, you're making something exactly right. There's something you have to sell. Oh, if people can't buy it, why invest in it? <clears throat> if you put it into financial speculation, there's nothing to sell. Right, it's, you, you can make a fortune overnight, uh, it just happens. So jobs are down, profits are up, right? Profits increased 32.5 billion in the third quarter. We're still looking for the fourth quarter numbers to come in. All internal funds available for corporate investment increased by 35, almost $36 billion in the third quarter. 
Could something be seriously wrong? Right? Is, this, is, this, is this normal? Is this just the, the business cycle? Or has something changed here? What's changed is this long-term decline in economic growth that you see here that goes back to the 1970s. This doesn't mean there's no growth. This means that the rate of growth, the rate at which growth is taking place, is stagnant. And it has been since the mid-70s. This is the main thing that, that changed in that period. Right. So economic growth creeping along, not keeping up with population growth, right, which is leading to sustained unemployment and people falling out of the workforce. Now I want to introduce you to Nouriel Roubini, uh, not, not, not somebody I, I normally quote. Uh, he is, uh, was an economist for the International Monetary Fund, and then he worked for the World Bank, and then he worked for the Federal Reserve. Uh, and then he was on President Clinton's Council of Economic Advisors, and now he's the senior treasury advisor uh, and has his own company and will advise you uh, if you can afford his services. And here is what he said. So Karl Marx, it seems, was partly right in arguing that globalization, financial intermediation run amok, and redistribution of income from wealth and wealth from labor to capital could lead capitalism to self-destruct. Now, he also added that socialism wasn't the answer, and so you're wrong about that part. But uh, this, this was an amazing admission of incomplete <laughs> as it was. The problem is that the financial system generates vast amounts of wealth for the 1%. Much of it exists only on paper, and all of it has to be reinvested to make still more wealth. Uh, if they could only stop at one turn of the wheel, uh, they might be able to uh, make, it, make it work. Right? But you constantly have to invest the new wealth to make more wealth to make more wealth, and the balloon keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, but it's all gas. The economy has never been stable, and it never will be. So now they tell us that crisis will always be part of the financial system. I wish they had told us that years ago. Or we might have made different choices. But if you know this, what might you do differently if you were an elected official or trying to put pressure on elected officials? What is the value of this bit of information? You want a safety net. You want a safety net. What else? Glass Say it again. Glass you want to reinstate Glass Steagall, right? What else? Save, save for the rainy day. Fund. You want to save for the rainy day fund, right? You want you want you 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 want the government to save money up in the good years, you know, like we had in the Clinton administration when they had a balanced budget, or uh, because they know that it's going to crash again, right? You want to stop saying that they've solved the problem. As, 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 as the Democrats did at that time. So here's the employment situation last month, right? Full-time jobs needed, uh, almost 24 million full-time jobs, uh, and that, that's counting uh, the unemployed, involuntary, part-time, and discouraged workers. Uh, and those are the official numbers, and it's, it's actually much, much worse because, as I'm sure you know, to be counted as unemployed, you have to have actively looked for work in the last four weeks. Uh, and if you didn't, you're out of the workforce and you disappear. So this is what they're willing to admit to. But the jobs problem is worldwide. Right? This is the UN International Labor Organization, the United Nations, that's job is to track this stuff. Uh, and they say that world unemployment is 205 million half of it in the most developed countries. But this is what struck me, this next sentence. More than 1.5 billion workers, slightly over half the world's workforce, labor force, are in vulnerable situations. Right? And by vulnerable situations, they mean that they can't find full-time, they can't find full-time year-round work. But right? half of the world's workforce can't find work. Right, so what, why should we think we're going to have a full employment economy here you know, by, by, cu by cutting the you know, Social Security payroll tax uh, when half the world's workforce can't find full-time work? 
Right? We, we are in a new era uh, regarding labor. And naturally, right, this is, this is a, uh, 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 how many workers can you count in this factory? I mean, it raises a question, right? Who, who is the 99%? So it's them. So this, this change in technology may mean that we all need to stay in school longer, work shorter hours, retire earlier, and that most new job creation will be in the public sector, which is just the opposite of what the right wing is saying, uh, and, and the center is now pandering to the right on all of these things. Uh, but if these guys are going to save themselves, uh, this is what they're going to have to do. Now, the worst thing is elected officials who talk about jobs and haven't a clue. Mr. Bundefall, you've talked about you want to incentivize small businesses. Tell me something. How do you create the job? The job is created, and it can be in a variety of ways, by a variety of people, but principally by people and businesses in response to demand for products and services. And the main point about jobs in Connecticut is we can and we should create more of them by creative policies. And that's the kind of approach that I want to bring to Washington. Recent polls have shown a fifth of Americans can't locate the U.S. on a world map. Why do you think this is? I personally believe that U.S. Americans are unable to do so because uh, some people out there in our nation don't have maps and uh, I believe that our ed education, like such as in South Africa and uh, the Iraq, everywhere like such as, and I believe that they should, uh, our education over here in the U.S. should help the U.S. Or, or should help South Africa and should help the Iraq and the Asian countries so we will be able to build up our future for <laughs> <laughs> so what, what do we need to be talking about right now for jobs? Uh, here's the best advice I've seen. This, uh, this is the manager of the world's largest bond fund, a Republican billionaire, uh, and he says, capitalism in its raw form can't pull us out of this hole. Could have said any form. And he suggested a direct government jobs program and he said, putting a shovel in the hands of somebody can be productive. But what did he mean, putting a shovel in somebody's hands? Uh, this was the New Deal Works Progress Administration that created uh, jobs for, for uh, uh, literally millions of people uh, in the 1930s, not by stimulating the economy in some indirect way, but by hiring people. Right? The, the only way you create a job is you hire somebody. The rest of it is, is barely real. Uh, so these guys are, are fixing roads. But what I always love, what I love about this picture, about that program, is that it wasn't just laborers that got jobs. They had jobs for unemployed artists, writers, actors, photographers. Uh, and here you see the, uh, uh, the unemployed artist uh, whose job is to sketch this picture of these guys <coughs> while they're fixing this road. And it wouldn't surprise me if the picture itself was the photo was made by one of the unemployed <laughs> photographers. Uh, so th th these guys built thousands of schools. They paved tens of thousands of miles of road. But that was the small stuff. Right. Roosevelt believed in huge projects that would pay for themselves. Right? The taxpayers didn't pay for the projects, they paid for themselves, and he created millions of jobs. Right? This is the Grand Coulee Dam. This is still the largest poured concrete structure in the world. It was built just to create jobs. That was the reason for it. Create jobs building it, and it is paid for itself many times over by selling the electricity that's generated by it. Uh, it, it generates every year three and a half times as much electricity as our nuclear plant up the Hudson 
uh, in the point 40 years old built on an earthquake fault. Uh, this is all clean hydropower. Grand Coulee Dam. Hoover Dam was a jobs project built just for the purpose of creating jobs, paid for itself. Tennessee Valley Authority paid for itself. LaGuardia Airport uh, paid for itself. The Triborough Bridge here in New York uh, paid for itself. The Lincoln Tunnel here in New York uh, paid for itself. But today the solution has to be even bigger than these projects. What would it do for jobs in the economy if Congress said that in 20 years it will be illegal to burn fossil fuel? What would they find? The industry would pick up on green energy and things like that. Oh, so they would pick up on green energy, and what would they have to do then to pick up on green energy? Oh, they have to produce the windmills. What else would they have to do? Teach people to make good windmills. Well, I'd have to teach people to make good windmills. What else? Buy rare metals from China. Probably. <laughs> a few. I think we have a few rare metals tucked away somewhere. Yeah. Probably in Fort Knox. What else? Hire people to build them. We'll to hire people to build them. What else? Train for them. You've got to train for them. You've got to hire people to train to train the people to build them. People have to buy them. Right. You have to, of course, have to do that. So where do those jobs come from? Well, there's a couple other things that would have to be done. But this is a somewhat less efficient way of generating heat than burning fossil fuel. So you would have to insulate, re-insulate just about all homes and public buildings. But you would have to tear the heating systems out of every building uh, and put the electric systems in. Uh, you would have to remanufacture every automobile on the road uh, and make it into an electric automobile. Uh, you would have to put up electric, electric charging stations right wherever there's a parking meter now. Uh, you'd have to do high-speed trains to reduce the use of cars. Uh, but the, this, this is the equivalent of World War II. Right? This wipes it out uh, and basically gives you a chance to start over again. And it could extend the life of capitalism by maybe another century before all of the same problems come back, because capitalism is doomed after all. But if, if, if you were thinking of living in it for any length of time, uh, this is about the only way to make that happen uh, decently. So why isn't government getting us here? Because the fossil fuel companies own it. The fossil fuel companies own it, pretty much. What else? <coughs> Money to be made right, so everybody wants to have the last bucket of oil, right? If you own the last bucket of oil, think what you could sell it for if nobody has prepared for the future when it's gone. Right? So that's basically it, right? That the, 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 hand, the hand of the past is, is controlling the future uh, in this situation, and that's, and that's what has to be shaken off. And, and the tragedy is that they've built a mass base uh, to support that on the right. While we struggle with a record-breaking deficit and a large national debt caused by the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, caused by tax breaks for the wealthy, caused by an unpaid for Medicare Part D prescription drug program, caused by the Wall Street bailout, driving up the deficit, driving up the national debt, that some people can say, oh my goodness, we got all of those expenses, and then we got to give tax breaks to millionaires and billionaires, but we want to balance the budget. Gee, how are we going to do that? Well, obviously, we know how they're going to do that. We're going to cut back on health care. We're going to cut back on education. We're going to cut back on child care. We're going to cut back on Pell programs. We just don't have enough money for working families and nannies. We're going to cut back on food stamps. We're surely not going to expand unemployment compensation. We got a higher priority, Mr. President. We have got to, got to, got to give tax breaks to billionaires. I mean, that's what this whole place is about, isn't it? They fund the campaigns. They get what's due them. So what needs to happen now as we wrap this up? Massive government works programs, 
federal money for states and cities, rebuild industry with green jobs, sunset the tax cuts, defend teachers and public service workers, protect Social Security and Medicare, end the wars, tax the 1% and the big corporations. That's the program. Okay, we got a few minutes for discussion. Somebody want to bring those lights up, Victor? Would you bring those lights up? Just a few of them. Yeah, that's enough. Right, thoughts about this? Yeah. How do we actually go about initiating some of those reforms in something like Citizens United? Well, that's the, that's the first point of attack. Right, is, 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 is Citizens United and, and, and changing, that, uh, changing that decision. Oh, I mean, the, the, the prior step is to see to it that it doesn't get a whole lot worse, right? which means that we don't want the Supreme Court to load it up with even more right-wingers, and then hopefully a few of these guys are going to die in the near future. <laughs> Me meanwhile, uh, we've got to be going after candidates who are, are getting this kind of corporate money uh, and, and doing everything to embarrass them uh, and, and force them to reveal where it's coming from. And we probably should start with the president himself now, who has just announced a, uh, uh, one of those super PACs of his own. Uh, and he has a great opportunity to make it different from the others by, by, uh, by, by publicly saying where his money is coming from. Uh, and, and we should be raising that demand. But it, it's probably one of the best things we could do for him to help him relax is make him be uh, uh, forthcoming about where the money is coming from. Uh, but uh, there's, there's a lot of grassroots stuff that we can do and we, with the, the, to kind of counterbalance some of that money. Uh, I, I really do believe that going door to door and doing that kind of work uh, makes a difference and, and helps you be able to overcome it. Uh, we, let, 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 me not, let me not go on. That's part of the, 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 part of the answer. Let me, let me see who else got questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, historically, the New Deal wasn't more of a compromise between socialists and capitalists. So if the socialists today are just asking for a new New Deal, um, wouldn't you want socialists to have more radical demands or to allow the liberals to allow this type of program for a compromise? Well, I mean, socialists didn't compromise in the New Deal. They continued to have the more radical demands. So you're absolutely right, because this wasn't the socialist program. Uh, this was the compromise program. So yeah, socialists need to have the more radical demands now uh, if, if, if we're going to come anywhere close to this. Uh, but the, the, the problem is that in the, in the New Deal, there wasn't the same level of, of belief in the country uh, that the government would only make things worse, that there was no role for the government, that the government was the problem. That, that didn't begin until the 1960s, really. Uh, and it didn't really take hold for another decade. And it was Barry Goldwater in 1964 that ran on that program. And he was thoroughly trounced for president. Uh, people didn't buy it. So you didn't have the kind of resistance, right? It was, it, it was only a question of, 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 of how far you could go and how big the program should be. Uh, that that uh, was, was the debate. So we, we, we've still got to go back to convincing people that there's anything that can be done at all and that this stuff works at all, uh, which means that we're, we're kind of in the same position that, uh, that Roosevelt was in, where he had to compromise with the Southerners in order to get any of this passed, uh, because they, 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 they controlled the committees in Congress and were totally against it. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right that we've got to be talking about stuff far in advance. And, and, and one of the great things about Occupy Wall Street is it scares people, uh, and people need to be scared. What scared them in the New Deal was the Russian Revolution, which had been consolidated after the Civil War in about 1925, right? And now we're talking about 1929, the stock market crashes. So all this is just happening, uh, and, 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 and people were terrified. Uh, what everybody now on the right is relaxed about is the collapse of the Soviet Union and the notion that there is no alternative. But, so part, part of this is working for the reform, uh, and part of it is, is showing that things are getting out of hand if reforms don't get made. Right? And, that, and, that, and that's why the street stuff has to be done and the demonstrations have to be done. So it's possible 
that the, that the more left-wing position uh, will be more tactical than, than policy this time. Is, are there any um, specific like, points of attack or on uh, transnational entities like IMF and the world bank that could be? Uh, I, I can't figure out how you get at them. I mean, they're, 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 they're totally unaccountable. Uh, and one, one of the benefits that may come out of the, uh, the, the, the collapse of some of the weaker countries in, in Western Europe now uh, is that they're collapsing because they followed the advice, or were for, it wasn't advice, it was forced on them uh, to follow those kinds of neoliberal policies. So there's, there's a chance to do some educational work uh, at least among people who know what a neoliberal policy is and want to talk about it, which isn't many people. But I, I, I think, by and large, these guys are out of reach for the time being. Anybody else? Yeah. How do you uh, kind of reconcile, or what, what are your thoughts on reconciling um, the fact that, like, you know, socialism is all about, you know, the industrial worker creating jobs, but at the same time, uh, we have to deal with the, the ecological implications of production? Um, and kind of figuring out, you know, certainly there's a future in green jobs, but if we continue to have a future of such, um, you know, a, invasive resource extraction, that's not really going to help us in the future either. Absolutely not, and, and, uh, and that's where the battle line is currently being drawn. Well, I mean, that, that's why we're against the pipeline. That's why we're against hydraulic fracturing. Oh, uh, you know, then the administration's response is go build more nukes, which is which is totally crazy. Uh, but I, but that that's that's the fight that's already being engaged, and we we just got to heat that up. Uh, and we we, we got to show that the jobs are really in the green stuff. Uh, you know, and, and the other stuff is jobs for people that already have those jobs, but it isn't it isn't a whole lot more than that. Yeah, well, yeah. Do you think that the one percent for the uh, right wing establishment is scary about the credit but It's hard to say. I mean, because they're not a they. I mean, they're not an it. They're a they. And it, it, there hasn't been a whole lot of indication or notice taken so far. Oh. Uh, you know, usually the, uh, the, the the right wing kind of lets you know what they're worried about. You know, so that we, we know they're worried about Obama, right? So you get all this goofy stuff about the birth certificate, you know, and is he really an American? Uh, and then some goofy right winger goes and writes a book uh, about how I'm really the brains behind Obama and the Midwest Academy that I work for is the plot that put him in the presidency, and then there's a chart with all these boxes, and there's me in a box right next to Rahm Emanuel, and it's all this big conspiracy. So, so they let you know what they're thinking about. Now, they haven't done that with Occupy Wall Street yet. Uh, I, I, I imagine it will catch up, uh, but we, we, don't, we, 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 don't, we don't see it. All we have seen is uh, link, linking in election campaigns, linking progressive Democrats who came out in support of Occupy Wall Street with Occupy Wall Street and trying to say, oh, well, you know, they're an Occupy Wall Street candidate, uh, which doesn't get them much traction and won't uh, unless there's an, an escalation of violence uh, by people who do it in the name of Occupy Wall Street, uh, which will then redound against a number of elected officials who supported them in the past. But other than that, we, we, don't, we don't see that they're worried yet. I don't, I don't know if they know what to make of it, and I don't know whether they think it has staying power. Uh, they don't see it cutting into their base yet. Uh, if there could ever be any kind of link up with any of the disgruntled Tea Party people, which I, I don't know if there can be, uh, that would certainly start to worry them. Yep. Well, I mean, the way I see this whole 99, 1% thing is that uh, it, it, it kind of glosses over too much of what we really face, you know, because the ruling class is broader than that, and all those that are essential to its functioning and stuff, and, and the, uh, you know, and that the fact that we do live in a class divided society, um, you know, it's very stratified, even among the working class and the middle class and stuff. And I think, um, you know, so it kind of obfuscates the, uh, you know, what, what is to be done, as Lynn said. 
And um, I think it's, but it's only through the working class struggle is how people are going to learn and transform themselves and learn from others um, to, to, you know, make a revolution and take power in this country. Because obviously they have no solution. You know, it's impacting the lives of billions across the planet and stuff, this devastation. And their only solution is to go out to work and be fluent. And war is international and stuff. And so any, I think any fight that happens that helps advance um, the position of working people uh, and our allies to defend ourselves and, and increase the confidence, no matter how small they are today, we've got to have that longer view of history. That's the only way that social struggle has changed um, things in the benefit of the masses. But I, I, I agree. It, it does depend on who you mean by the working class and what you mean by the struggle, but I'm, I'm sure we all agree on that. Yeah. Anybody want to be the last word on this? No, nobody wants to be the last word. Okay, we are recessed.